Steve, welcome to LSI. Good to see you here, man. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you here in beautiful Lisbon. It is nice, except for the fires. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Did you get that? I think Porto, I had some friends in Porto, couldn't even breathe from what I understand. But yeah. here, we're safe. We're good, yeah. yeah, yeah. We're good. We're good. Yeah. So again, LSI crushes it this year. Scott yeah. and his team, great venue, fantastic uh, investors, strategics and startups along the way. What's been your observation so far? Yeah, really good. I mean, got through day one yesterday, um, brilliant sessions, saw a lot of very exciting tech. Some tech I knew before, but uh, there's a lot of exciting tech. And what was good is there was a lot of updates on things like, you know, a lot of the, the companies here were giving their updates on some of the latest clinicals or their closing of rounds. Uh, yeah, so I think it's just been really interesting. And then there was some really interesting new tech that I've not seen, I've not seen before, very early stage people in their seed rounds that were looking. I think, you know, to keep an eye on some of the imaging stuff that was really interesting, so yeah. And 2024 is shaping up certainly better this time than last year, 2023. Yeah. We're seeing a financings, it's $150 million financing round, 105, 93, 97, bunch of 50s, bunch of 30s, acquisitions. Yep. So yep. I'm, I'm tending to see more of this roll up and that takes us into um, the activity going on in surgical robotics and in the, in the interventional robotics, the things you and I like to sort talk of poke about. around at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now there is going a lot. I, I, I'm, I feel happier again this year watching the whole financing situation. Uh, I think last year I was a little bit concerned that you know it, it really drawn back and, and maybe too much. And it's good to see deal flow coming in. It's good to see a deal flow on, you know, for people putting the money in and also some of the exits that are happening. You know, obviously we have a, a census and Storts, which has been one of the big ones in the robotics industry this year. And I think that's setting the scene for where a lot of the strategics are, you know, are gonna have to go. And I think we're gonna start seeing some of that consolidation of the robotics market based on, again, you know, people like to follow. <laughs> Yeah, and you, you mentioned it, you, you, you hit it a couple months ago when we sat, where you said, look, this is the vintage right now. And, and, and you and I have touched on this. Yeah. It's really important because it's gonna come in, it's gonna bite one or two of the players in the behind when the music stops. Because yes. you've just got a couple platforms out there in this vintage, and then you've got years. And I'm talking about mid to large format soft tissue robotics. Yeah, I think that, you know, not having been through it, it just takes a decade to get you know, your, your system out there, platform stable. And even, even once you launch it on the market, you know, it takes a while to get stability. I mean, we're talking fifth generation for Da Vinci. And um, a lot of these vintages now are first generation still. And it's gonna take 10 years for the next generation. Between the XI and the DV5 was a decade. So, you know, uh, and they're the best at it in the world, right? So I think that we're gonna see um, the current bunch that's out there that are gonna be available and some of those are gonna get scooped up. And then, you know, people are gonna be sat there when the music stops and there'll be no chair to sit on and they'll say, okay, what do we do now? And then there's gonna be a decade. And that can be a massive threat to some people's business, right? You know, if they really wanna be into that area um, and it's gonna to go to end luminal as well, if they, if they don't get into this area now, they could actually be out of it for up to a decade. And there are some organizations right now. So let's just look at the current construct. I know maybe one of these you're gonna to have to abstain from from past experience, but you know, you got CMR out there. You've got distal motion out there. Um, you've got Moon that we refer to as 2.0, Lap yep. 2.0, yep. but I'm still gonna put them sort of in that category yep. a little bit. Um, for their sake, that could be a liability, but I, I, I think that that Lap 2.0 is a separate category, but for today, let's put them in there. Uh, and then you've got the Asian robots sitting yeah. out there, and you've got some strong opinions about those. Yeah, um, you know, I, I've had a lot of exposure recently to some of the Asian robots coming in. And um, my historic way of thinking about this was these would be like cheap copies. And I've been very pleasantly surprised, and I'm often wrong, so <laughs> I was happy to be wrong on this one. You know, I spent some time, for example, you know, I sat on the, the two Mai, and um, I found it really hard to understand if I was working on an XI or not. And I kept pulling my head out of the console, looking and saying, is this an XI or not an XI? The running gear that's underneath it is obviously you know, very modern. Um, the way that they've implemented the software is really good. They've got really fast response times. I was just very impressed with, with Tumai. It, it surprised me it wasn't just like a cheap feeling copy of an XI. That's what I had in my head. And I've actually walked away now thinking slightly differently about that. 
I think, you know, and again, get your concepts on, will these be allowed to ever be plugged into the wall in the US is, uh, uh, you know, that's for us to see. And I know you've got some opinions on that. Yeah, look, I've, I've talked to some of the health providers who run their robotics programs and they've, I won't say specifics, but they've clearly said, I said, I would have a very difficult time having one of those plugged into the wall of uh, a surgical robot plugged yep. into our wall, but given, given the TikTok factor that yep. enters yep. a medical yep. device, yep. right? Um, and then even if it wasn't prohibitive, uh, I still think you're gonna have lobbyists yes. absolutely pushing against that for defense here yep. in the States, whether it's intuitive or it's uh, 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 Stortz right now. Um, but you pointed out this morning when we were strolling over here, there's already Chinese platforms plugging into and, and garnering data. Yeah, the, so again, I think people will be surprised. If you actually go and look at the root ownership of the companies, there are several fairly well-known medical device companies in the world. Like, you know, a, a lot of people didn't, don't know that Microport is you know, from, from China. Great company, f phenomenal products. You know, they do a lot in cardiovascular. A lot, a lot of their stuff's already plugged into the wall. So I think it's gonna be um, an interesting time for them to work out how to, from a marketing point of view, obviously, to go at it as well. And from a cyber sec point of view, um, they're gonna have to you know, deal, deal with certain organizations in the US that are gonna, the lobbyists that'll be against them. And again, that's why when, when I was asked to do a prediction on what, where the market will be in 10 years, um, that's why I said that I still think Intuitive has way more dominance in the US than outside the US. Because I think if you're a Chinese robot, you will have a strong presence in China. Yeah. You know. yeah. Well, when, when we talk about Asia too, we tend to index towards China because of the prolific yeah. development there. But I'm going to go to India for a second. Yeah. You know, SS Innovations, yeah. what uh, Sudhir has done there. I think they've got 2,000 procedures under the belt. Yep. Zero adverse events. Yep. And out of that, a solid percentage is cardiac. Yes. Which is what the platform was originally developed for, yeah. just like Intuitive's original product, but yep. they couldn't quite get the traction there and it ended up in a urologist's hands and everybody knows that story there. Yeah. But they've got, they've positioned themselves as a digital first company that their first platform is Mantra but now they're, they're also gonna be pushing other interventional technologies and endoluminal technologies out because their rate of development there is just absolutely phenomenal, almost comparatively to an intuitive. Yeah, they've done a great job. And um, what I've been impressed with, with the whole team there is that speed that they, they've gone at this. And, but not lost, they've not lost the quality, you know, it's not been reckless, okay? I think that's an important thing for everyone to know. They've been fast, uh, because there's just a lot of smart people in India, and a lot of people in India, <laughs> and you can get a very good team working together. And of course, everybody stands on the shoulders of giants, so it makes it a little bit easier and faster to do some things. You mentioned the cardiovascular. I think that that's gonna be their big differentiator there, which is, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people, also in the US, um, that have asked for cardiovascular over the years. I mean, T. Sloan Guy is one of the people who's been really pushing for years that there be a cardiovascular robot. And Sudhir, coming from a cardiovascular surgical background, has been, been on it. And they're not just doing what Intuitive did back in you know, the day. They've got things like anastomotic couplers. Oh, yeah. This is, I, I mean, mean, that's yeah. a product in itself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you, take, if you took a manual version of that, I mean, we worked on that for years at J&J &J and Medtronic had them, and, you know, with the guidance ones and all, all the different ones at St. Jude. And they're pushing the envelope. I mean, that's what I really like about them, besides being very nice people, they're mm -hmm. lovely people. Mm -hmm. But the, the, they, they are massively pushing the envelope and thinking a little bit out of the box of what the robot can do. And, you know, certainly Fred's active in nearly any robotic company there is, but he just signed on as vice chair, for yeah. I think, or co-chair, yeah. chairman there. Um, and they are, they released out in the public domain the other day that they're coming, they've already started with the FDA. Yes. And I think aggressive. Yeah. They thought by the end of 25, maybe the beginning of 26, they might have cleared with the FDA, which I think is very aggressive. Yeah. But they seem to think that some of their work outside of the U.S., is gonna be applicable to pursue the FDA here. 
Yeah, I think that what they were saying was that, that you know, they'll have a majority of data that comes out of India, for example. They might do a small delta study, but you then end up with small delta studies for the IDE, uh, for example, in the US, which makes it just faster, easier. You, know, you don't have to do 100 patients, you have to maybe do 10. So I think that the interesting thing is, and again, when I was at SRS sitting in on the FDA, I think the FDA is trying to help to get through. Now, I don't think that they will get the kind of equivalent to be able to do 510K. I don't think they'll be able to do that. It's too different. But I think the FDA um, went through a, a blip where they were trying to work out what they wanted to do. And I think they've come through that now. And I think they understand better. And I think their guidance is clearer. And I think that their thinking is clearer on how they get these devices through. So I, I, yes, aggressive timelines. And if you were to look back 219 through to 221, you say, you know, no way they're going to do it. It's an aggressive timeline, but you know, it's not impossible now. Well, they've proved it with Mantra 3 coming out, so that was pretty substantial. So, so let, when we talk about technology here in a digital forward organization, when we look at the strategics here, yeah. and I'm gonna go across the board on strategics. I'm gonna say Boston Scientific, I'm gonna say Olympus, I'm gonna say J&J, Medtronic, even Beckton Dickinson on the, the peripheral side. These organizations arguably eventually gonna need an, an interventional robot, an endoluminal robot, if yep. they want to hold market share. Yeah. You just need to do it. Yeah. However, none of them are digital first organizations. Yeah. And I bring this up because you and I have had, yesterday I moderated a panel and the term build to buy was tossed out. Yes. And even amongst the panelists who are really well educated in the med device market, there seemed to be a mis alignment on what build to buy meant. So let's try and unpack that for the audience. Yeah. So when it starts to get used in the marketplace, we at least can establish some perimeter and fence posts. Yeah, so l let me start um, with, with my thoughts of the, the why, but I always like to start with the why behind stuff. And um, I think that strategics are really good at certain things. You know, they're, they're, they're generally good at quality systems and lots of red tape. They're generally good at that, which is good. Um, they, they're generally quite good at clinical as well. They have big clinical teams that get things done and they have phenomenal footprint sales, marketing, commercial reach. Okay, you don't need to go and build an entire sales force for these strategics, they have them. And if they're, they're taking a product in that's in one of those sectors, they kind of have a ready to go sales force. Where I found over the years, and it's not, a, it's not I don't want it to be a criticism of them, but it's just a reality. The, the ultra, Star end innovation, they're not good at. Iteration, they're good at. You know, taking 10 cents out, making it slightly longer, making it more blue, making it more red. They're very, very good at that. They have great engineers who do that. But the innovation, just the, the setup of a strategic is not designed for innovation. On the flip side, you have um, the innovative startups who are great at the innovation, the early R&D, the, the break it fast, the test it fast, to get it all through very quick. We're going wrong, pivot. You talked a lot yesterday about pivot. So you know, pivoting, they're great at that, but they don't have you know, 2,000 people sales force across the US to go and just feed that into. They've got to build the sales force and the marketing. That's a colossal waste of money for somebody who you know, eventually ends up giving it to somebody else. So the why for me is you've got two, two different structures that both have incredible qualities in each of them, and it's just so obvious. Let one do one thing, and then let the other do the other but work that out beforehand. Yeah, and, and it's, you bring up some great points here. They also, another resource that the strategics have is cash. Yes. Right, and sometimes have, I, I had a business at one point in time and I had a friend who had a similar business and he was very, very, very successful. And uh, he said, sometimes having too much cash is an issue. Yeah, yeah. And that happens with the strategic sometimes, yeah. having too much cash. And on the startups or the emerging tech, not having enough cash is an issue. But I, I want to come back here because it's true. After I've been in this industry for 34 years and built north of 800 startups, and I presented yesterday here at LSI and I talked about this balance of chaos and order. Yes. And chaos sometimes is interpreted as a, as a negative connotation and it's not. No. Chaos is where all the creativity happens. It always happens on the fringe. Yep. And then what you need is the orderly types to pull it in. Yes. Because you do have to deal with FDA. Yeah. You have to d establish quality systems. Yeah. You've got to have a structured dis discipline go-to-market team. Yes. Right? But 
the product that you're developing has to be out here in the fringe. If you're an engineer in a large corporate, you get punished yeah. for being on the fringe and being wrong. Yes. Where in startups, you're on the fringe, I didn't get it right, but I learned something. Yeah. And then we pivot. Yeah. Corporate doesn't pivot. They pivot on balance sheets. They tend not to pivot on technologies. Yes. And it's hard for them to do it, right? Because you've got massive teams that they have to be. None of this is a negative yeah. intent, uh, intention. This is a discussion around why built to buy works. Yeah. Now has to sit here. So let's say I'm a company and I'm in the, um, I'm in the uh, interventional space. Yeah. And um, my catheters and products are meant for anything in the coronary region. Yeah. But I don't have a robotic program. Yeah. What am I going to do? Go out and hire a bunch of robotic engineers to come into my organization when I'm not a digital first organization? So this sets up how does that build to buy work? I've seen it a bunch of different ways. When I did Verb yeah. Surgical and some other clients, right? Yeah. So I, th I think there's, there's different ways that it can work, and it's all going to be about the front-end negotiation and governance. Who's going to be responsible for what by when, and what are you going to deliver by what by when, and what does each party bring to it and not bring to it, and the division of labor, the division of um, uh, responsibility has to be very clearly mapped out in the beginning. So what you can do is, for example, you, you could have it where you know, company X says, you know, we're not going to do this ourselves inside, and they could go and find a nascent technology that is in the area with a, with a team that's already going, and they can just finance that, give them the money, and it could be completely hands-off, but we have an option to buy it at a distance. That's one very basic flavor. The other flavors can be all the way across, and again, it's for the teams to work out what's good. So if the big strategic is very strong and has a good um, quality and regulatory system that is, you know, can work well to do that, they could make that accessible to this company. If, for example, um, they don't want to take the whole amount of money themselves, they could basically, by putting their name to it, they can bring in other investors who will say, well, if there's a guaranteed you know, first right of refusal, and you've got to be careful of this, it's not a guaranteed buy, mm -hmm. uh, but it's got to be some kind of guaranteed right of refusal at certain milestones, at certain valuations. Um, then it, other investors may, you know, some of the big VCs or some of the PEs may say, oh, well, actually, if I've already got kind of a, a, a pre-arranged exit, very likely, then we'll bring money in. So they can leverage all those kind of things. And there's a whole flavor of that in between. But I think um, there's, there's two things that are going to drive this at the minute. One is, as more and more of the big companies realize they're failing and they're throwing lots of money and failing, and the second thing is, is uh, you know, um, is like the Oris and J&J &J way that that deal was done, I think is going to get both startups and strategics to really rethink about what they're going to do. And the diligence too involved in that, you know, the, the information, again, just using the example of the Oris J&J &J situation, that information in the public domain with the, 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 the court cases. Um, I wouldn't call it sloppy, but I wouldn't call it world-class um, sort of call out of milestones. Yeah. Um, and then the court, of course, found J&J &J in violation of killing that um, FDA clearance for the product at a yeah. certain point and actually taking it off the table. But that comes down to the governance and diligence yes. involved. The other thing, too, that I've seen is you have a technology that sits at a consulting house. Yes. The large strategic sees the technology and says, that's a technology that we need because we can't develop it in-house. We've tried a bunch of times. Yeah. I call it um, the three VP problem. You hire the first VP to try and build it. Yeah. That VP fails. Then you bring another VP in yeah. who tries to clean it up, and that fails because it's not native to you. And the third VP is really a program manager who manages the outside consulting firm yeah. that builds it yeah, eventually. Exactly. But you take it from the consulting house, then you bring in either a venture or a PE firm. Yeah. And this has happened in biotech for yep. decades. Yep. And that firm then drives that project. The strategics keeps it off balance sheet. And they also have rules of engagement and a predetermined price at a certain milestone. Yes. And so you have aligned interests there. You have speed, you have experts here. Yep. And to your point, you can bring in 
pre-negotiated, because I saw this and I lived it with J&J &J with Verb, yep. what Pablo and Scott and some of the other, and Dave did was brilliant up until the hundredth person was brought into Verb. Yeah. After that, J&J &J started to get into the hallway too much. Yeah. And what happened was, as well as the good things that J&J &J brings, the less desirable things came yep. along. And it just got insinuated into the process further and further for the very same reason they wanted to outsource it in the first place. Exactly. So I think the build to buy is going to be a pathway forward for robotics for this generation. Yeah. yeah. Until these companies decide to start a new division that's purely robotics yeah. or will continue to outsource to these expert organizations. So uh, you, you talk a lot about the people there. And you know, at the end of the day, companies are people. You know, it's, it's, it's a brand, it's logo, but it's people, right, that make the companies. So you, you, you've raised a couple of very interesting things there. First of all, if I went to my network today and said, hey, you know, company X, big strategic, is about to go and build a robotic, do you want to go in? I don't think I could get anybody to join those companies. Anyone worth, worth their credit in, in, in the industry. You know, and a lot of those conversations go on. So I think that's one of the problems. The second problem is also for the strategic. So I'm there building my career, okay, and I see this new shiny toy that, oh, look, and I go into it and I fail. That's a career killer, right? So also, a lot of my friends who are in the strategics, when I say to them, hey, you know, some interest, they go, <laughs> you know, I'm staying with the cash cow business that's like steady, eddy, I've got four years to retirement, I ain't making a mistake here, and I'm not going to get, you know, fired before my time. And I think that this is also the beauty of the bill to buy, right? You've got individuals with different skill sets, personality types, traits, and you know this better than anybody, right? You've built, how many startups have you been uh, involved north in? North of 800. Right, okay. So you know the kind of right person to put in there and the right person that's in the strategic. Absolutely. And they've, they've both got brilliant merits, you know, each to do their own thing. And I think what happens is, with the build to buy is you keep the right people in the right place with the right technology and the right governance in both of the sides. And it's only when the thing is ready and baked properly that you've all agreed on, and that's why the upfront diligence and governance is going to be critical on this. Then you take it from one group who are, you know, the Mavericks sort of, they'll just go out there and build it, but they're not very good usually at the commercialization because that takes a lot of discipline, right? And you take that chaotic group and you bring them across the fence and you give it to the professionals who will then take that and build that and scale that to a massive business. And I think that's the beauty of the build to buy. And I think if, if everyone can get their heads around this properly, it's not a competition. No, it's, it's not, not we, we failed, we couldn't do it ourselves. It's let the chaotic experts do their bit and we do our bit and it's a beautiful match. Yeah, and, and the one thing I will share that I, I think you're going to see start to blend into there. Because you and I know this is not an episodic build. Yeah. But you can, you can have an architecture be good for a good, maybe, maybe not 10 years. Yeah. But it's probably going to come to a five-year cycle just because of the rate of acceleration. Yeah. But when I am that build to buy team and I hand it over to the strategic, the biggest issue strategic is going to have moving forward is the retention of the Tribal knowledge. Time. Yeah, I know, I know. And so what you're going to start to see is the smart players are going to say, let's get our Mavericks out front. Yeah. Let's get our fast start team going. Yeah. And then hand selected from the large strategic. Yeah. Psychological assessments. I'm telling you, because I sat in the belly <laughs> of the beast. Psychological <laughs> assessments, collaboration uh, uh, assessments, the, the people who can handle that agility between their technical enough engineers, they're in there for that pull through. Because if you just drop that hot potato on it, to your point, Steve, you could put out 10 robots, okay. 100 robots, okay. 1,000 robots, there is such a difference. And the engineering that's gonna go south, 10 to 100 to 1,000, yeah. you lived, that's where the next level of thinking and execution is going to happen. Yeah, you're so right. And, and this brings a very important point about when you set up your, your milestones and governance. It's not when a product's launched, right? This is, this, is what, this is one of the things that I think people don't understand, especially on robotics. The day that you launch a robot, it's pretty unstable, 
right? I mean, you know, look at Medtronic and Hugo, they're still fighting with the instruments, they're fighting with the software, like day in, day out, and they're three years into a launch. There has to also be within the governance thing about you know, how you get to stability and then who takes on the stability, who helps with the stability. And there is gonna be a period, that gray period in between where you know, this team, do you bring them in, not bring them, I mean, a lot of them won't wanna go in, so, so how are you also gonna set your governance up from where you do the handover so that it's, I call it like handing the baby over so that you don't drop it, right? And, and, and that's one of the dangers they'll have in this is that if they get their milestones wrong, it'll be gets passed over and the baby gets dropped. There will be a point where the company will be able to take it, but it's gonna be three years, four years, and then they can go to their cost compression. Then they can go to you know, driving 10 cents out of a screw here and a, a spring hit there. That whole thing, I think, is going to be really important for the teams on both sides to, to come and say, just the day that we, we get you know, FDA is not when that thing's ready for prime time. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to continue doing some engineering. And when do, you, when do you hand that engineering over? I think that's going to be difficult. And, and that, that is a habit that's going to have to be broken because, again, most device companies sell a single device yes. that really doesn't have... Uh, 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 the complex, anything near the complexity, nor the follow-up, nor as you yeah. said, you know, when, when you release a product out, a classic device, after it's gone through V&V &V and you've sort of burned it in and you've sold your first 50, the next thousand are the, pretty much the same. Yeah. Because the complexity and interchange is not there between care teams, between installs, locations, yeah. service, yeah. Yeah. uptime, downtime, software changes, you know, just continue the list here. So, it's going to be really interesting the next five years, and you and I have joked about this, about opening up our own consulting firm, about, about like that time from the, the Maverick team to the fast start to the handoff, and then who are the right people in the market to get that through? If the large strategists could shake their pride and ego, which drives them to make poor decisions, they will start to collaborate with individuals and organizations yeah. that can accelerate that at a high level of competency. Yeah, and I, and I think that, again, that's gonna be part of the model in the future. You're gonna have these tiger teams, right? They're, they're people who won't wanna be in a J&J &J or won't wanna be in a Boston Science. You know, they just, they've been there, done it, they've, had, they've got the corporate T-shirt and they just don't wanna do it again. But they can contribute in there. If you set up, again, the methodologies in the right way where, where these teams can contribute in and work within, but without being sucked into the belly of the beast, um, I think that's also going to be part of it because these are not like a basic suture or a staple. And, you know, they are difficult in themselves, and I, I get that. But the iteration, the continuation, and the drive is, is, is really important in software updates. And the whole thing on a robot is difficult, right? You can't compartmentalize it in the way that people think they can't compartmentalize it. You, you bolt a stapler on, well, that affects everything else, right? So. Again, in these complex systems, some of the um, neurovascular systems that are going to come out, the, the interaction between the catheter, the friction, the way that it all works, it, it's all going to have to work. And I think that it's not going to be the clean handover in some of these very complex systems. Maybe more basic products, yes. But the, the hando, this whole handover is the bit that I think we as an industry are going to have to work out. And I think there'll be a couple of train wrecks on the way, but we'll eventually work it out. And as you say, People have got to put their pride away because it's not about I'm not capable to do it. It's I'm really good at this bit, but these experts are good at that and they don't want to be in my house, right? They just don't want to be in. How do we work that out? Yeah, and, and one other thing that really is important to understand is when you're putting a complex robot out to market, again, endoluminal, soft tissue, mid, large format, and the vascular, you are just trying to get it over the line for a single indication. And once you get your clearance, then that's really when development super starts. Yes. Because, you know, we will have some very sort of segmented robots that will do one thing, one thing only. But for the most part, there's going to be multiple indications. Yep. And then the goodies that were hidden under the hood can be un unleashed. But again, to your point, there's a lot of hardware, software, firmware, tribal knowledge. So you can't just hand that over and go, okay, you get the rest of the indications. We're done here. I'm can't counting my cash. Yeah. So that's, that's also going to come into the reward, right? And how you set up very early on the reward for 
the team that's going to build this and what's the continued reward to keep them engaged? Because at the, at the end of the day, you know, everyone loves the technology and stuff, but it's not a charity, right? And the kind of people who do startups, you know, they, they want to have their reward. Why not mailbox money? I'm going to throw it out here right now. If I'm a developmental firm, let's say I'm a PA consultant, yeah. right? Let's just, or Cambridge consultants, yeah. I'm not going to pay favorites, or Sedentia, one of those three who are really prolific at robotic yes. development, right? How about you incentivize me for the deliverable of the milestones? Then you incentivize me for additional indications or, and then you incentivize me for the hundredth robot. Yep. I'm not working for you anymore, no. but I'm getting a royalty. Yes. Mailbox money. Yeah. And then I'm available at any time, but I'm getting that check. Yeah. That one or two zeros on at the end of every yeah. month. Yeah. And I'm here when you need me. I'm in your insurance policy. And, and that's, that's really, and we, we've sort of discussed this a little bit, and I, and, I, and I think that that's the way that you get people engaged. It's a little bit like a retainer sort of in a way, but you, you retain the brain. Yes. And, and that's, that's what you really need, because the engineers will work a lot of it out, but there'll be some specific tribal knowledge that they'll just say, you know, we, just, we don't know the fundamentals of how this was built. And you can go back to the people who do know that, and they're still engaged, and it's all friendly, and it's all done in a really nice, you know, there's no animosity where they were dragged into the company, had a really bad experience, and then went out there saying, oh yeah, I'll never work with those guys again. Mm -hmm. That's what we've got to keep, what we've really got to avoid. Yes. And as you say, I think the mailbox money way is, is the right way to go on this. And again, it's all going to come down to, a group of adults have got to sit in a room, and we've got to say what we're good at, what we're bad at, acknowledge it, it's not a criticism of every, anybody or anything, but we all say that's the right way to do it because the industry needs it, right? Otherwise, we're going to have train wrecks again. Yeah. And then um, I, want, I want to finish up with one other thing, and I want your thoughts on this. Is, um, and, and I'm glad we're going to memorialize this. So I was sitting in a couple panels, and I keep on hearing this, and it's relative to robotics, but it's really the whole digital thing. I keep on hearing the data lake the data moat, <laughs> but how about the torrent of data and the data river? Because when I think about moat and I think about lake, I think of a static body of water Stagnation. just sitting there, <laughs> yeah. right? With silt on it. And again, that's the old mindset when people say, well, we have a great data lake and we're gonna build a data moat around our business. I'm like, why don't you just have this torrent of water slash data and you keep on widening that torrent yes. of data that's coming in. And so I want you and I to like mint this here is throw out data lake, throw out, throw out moat, and it's a torrent, a river of data that I think we're gonna be managing moving forward. Yeah, it's, it's so really funny. So, so Microsoft had Microsoft Glass. I don't know if you saw the Microsoft Glass project, which was keeping, keeping data in these data lakes, right? And it's, I, we, I still don't think people have understood the amount of data we're going to deal with here. The, these data lakes are just massive. And then Microsoft Glass was coming out because what they were saying was a lot of that data just falls to the bottom of the lake and you never use it again. It's expensive to keep it on these servers. Mm -hmm. So instead, just put it into you know, storage forever. What that tells me is uh, that there's just, I don't think people know what to do with a lot of this data. That's one of, one of the things. And when you talk about these giant data lakes, I just wonder how much of the stuff is sitting in there that no one's ever going to look again, no one's ever going to touch again, no one's ever, because it's stagnant stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and again, so we'll say, oh, some, I'm sure some data experts say, oh, we, we, we go in and fish some of the data out there. No, I don't think they do. So I think two things that come out of this, you've got to have, a, you've got to have the data rivers. It's got to be live and active data, okay? Because it's got to be meaningful and it's got to be current. Um, but I think we also have to start getting more selective of what data we are gonna use and what, what's gonna be useful, what's not gonna be useful. And don't just make these masses, massive, we might need it in the future, you know, in 30 years from today, we might need this data. I think we've gotta do a better job of um, keeping the data, I, I like your, yeah, as a river, I like it, um, but what's in it? You know, you, you know, just crap going forwards and backwards is, is not a river, that's just a sewage farm, right? <laughs> so so, so I, I think we, we, we have to work out also what data is going to be useful in there. So I'm, I'm actually in Bologna um, for the rest of this week oh, um, with right. Filippo Villacori, and yeah. you know, they're talking a lot about data. It's the AI2M meeting. And again, I think the industry, especially when you've got um, non 
digital native companies looking at this stuff, you know, they'll get bamboozled very easily by what is meaningful, what's not meaningful. And I think as an industry, we do have to start working out what is the right data to be looking at and then how do we keep that data live and flowing and making use of it. Agreed, agreed. Well, Steve, I always love our conversations. Yeah, I do. And uh, what a great setting for this. Uh, Portugal, LSI 2024. So always appreciate it, my friend. Yeah, and you. Thanks, Thanks man. Cheers. I'm Joe Mullings from Sintra, Portugal. Be well.